All right, we are going to hit on part two with the application of concepts of the outlier considerations to improve morbidity and mortality during active shooter events. So this is the follow-up to part 1A and part 1B, so hopefully you've checked that out. We've waited at starting this part and hanging part 2 and part 3 up for a couple reasons. One is we wanted to get the HRO podcasts up. We feel that if you look at those HROs and you look at your active shooter response plan or your SOPs or what your departmental SOPs are, how you're working the interoperability facets of it with Rescue Task Force and EMS, and that if you can place that plan through the HRO filter, just kind of using those five principles, that you're going to get a good idea of, of how prepared you are, where those operational gaps are. So we wanted to get the HRO podcast hung, and at least the text that goes along with those podcasts. So if you haven't had a chance to check those out, go check those out. And then take a look at your plan and how that kind of fits in and see what the results are. The second part of it was probably we've been busy and lazy. So that being said, that was accounting for the delay on this. So in part two, what we're going to discuss is a little bit on breaching and some ways to potentially improv that. So we will look at a Halligan technique or two here and there, but understand the Halligan specific portion of this presentation is going to be part three, where we're going to go into a lot more of the background history and application of that from one person techniques and and considerations. We're also in part two here going to discuss a little bit on casualty collection points, a little bit of overview considerations, and some of the things that, that are, we're working on and what we've seen kind of at that national level. And we're going to talk a little bit about getting casualties out and some quick ways that we can do that that may be more effective than, than carrying folks through there. So now that the HRO podcasts are up, take a look at those, see how your plan looks, run it through those filters uh, at that basic level, and take a look. And we want to be really precise in this is some people have hit us up and they're like, hey, is this kind of an evidence-based medicine or evidence-based methodology used in this? Because a lot of the things we're talking about are, are definitely data and actual factual type deals of these events that you don't always hear. And the answer is definitely a resounding no. Nothing that we do or will do in the future will have anything to do with evidence-based medicine we a lot of times there's committees and things like that that kind of hide behind that guys where evidence-based sounds really really cool like you aren't even gonna argue that it's evidence-based man so that that's pretty much it but when you dig down on what evidence-based medicine really is and we look at the efficacy of that we're gonna see that that's probably a really bad model to follow especially if that's what you're hanging your hat on so everything that we're doing is an hro focus of how we look at these events and we're looking for outliers which evidence-based medicine ebm stuff does does not it doesn't handle those things very well at all when we're looking at meta-analysis and random control trials and the ways that we do inclusion exclusion criteria for this it's very you can manipulate the crap out of it so we definitely stay as far away from that side of the house as possible just because we've seen the efficacy of evidence-based medicine and you know and guidelines that have come out and we see how well that that works out and we really stay away from that so hro is what we look at we look for outliers we look for those things that are often missed we look down to the minutiae knowing that everything that you're going to do is in a dynamic situation ebm does not account for that so this is an hro look at these type of events so starting this thing off, we're going to go ahead and kick it off with just probably uh, upsetting some of the vendors out there. So we're going to make a, a point of not mentioning the name of companies, committees, vendors, things like that, in hopes of not really making people mad and the avoidance of lawsuits, I guess. So with that being said, if we look at manual breaching, whether it's a Halligan, whether it's a RAM, anything like that. It is a mathematical issue. So when we look at the Halligan specifically on this slide, it takes a little bit of physics, a little bit of geometry, and a little bit of material science, and you are in the door. With this understanding, you've also made breaching much easier and have taken some of the mystery out of it. To know these fundamentals is what allows you to improvise when you don't have the perfect tools. I mean, not every patrol car is going to have a Halligan and we may need to improvise the way that we're breaching that padlock with a tire iron or something like that. So knowing the, the fundamentals is what 
is your your cornerstone or building block for being able to improv off this off this and and the teaching methodology that's out there a lot of times whether it's through a fire academy or it's uh, you know specifically you know, I can recall in SWAT school our training on the Halligan is you know you put that fork in the in the seam or you put that ads in the seam somebody hits the crap out of it right until you think you got a good purchase point. And then you just start pulling as hard as you can on the thing. And what we'll see is that that's, we probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to use that technique. There's much easier, easier technique out there. And those that do this technique and those that we've done a lot of breaching with in the past are amazed at how easy it is. You know, that response is always, why didn't we learn this before? And I can say the same thing because I spend a lot of time having somebody just pound the living crap out of the end of that halligan and me trying to pull just trying to use Mongo type strength to get that door open. And once we apply some of the science behind it, things become much clearer and much easier to get into, especially those really difficult doors with multiple deadbolts on there or other fortification uh, in there. So we touched on some of the, the physics in our blog that we did uh, about a month ago about training door selection and the key parameters of that and why that firehouse innovation store works so well. And you'll kind of see that a little bit more as we we continue on in here. So we'll go deeper into that into the Halligan in part three of this series. But in a nutshell, you're going to see on the Halligan on the right. So if we're looking up there and we've kind of got a cursor going here, if we're looking at the Halligan on the right there, that is a Paratech single piece forged. So that is that's what we use quite a bit. And I know there's a lot of pro bar lovers out there, and I like myself a pro bar too. We have found that the the angles on there we have to do less grinding on it for one person application and less modifications to this than we do on the pro bar which is a little bit fatter and, and we'll kind of talk about that here in a little bit but this is the the paratech that we use quite a bit in there so we've got the ads in here which is kind of the duck bill in then we got the pike uh, which is your spike end the shaft and then the forks going down the end so on you'll notice on that we kind of highlighted it in some some green some green glow paint that we put on there is on that ads right around an inch and a half to inch and a quarter, three quarters, I'm sorry, an inch and a half to inch and three quarters, depending on your preference, is usually where we grind in on that ads and also on the fork. And that's really kind of a key measurement on there. And we'll talk about why 1.5 versus 1.75 inches on there in a second. But basically at that 1.75 marker is where your door frame is gonna be. That's where your door stop, your door jam. So let's just say, we're breaching a door that comes towards us, knowing that we can use this Halligan just as effective on doors that go away from us, which is usually what we reserve that ramp for. Doors that come towards us or doors that go away from us, uh, we can use on the Halligan for very, very rapidly if, if we understand a little bit of what we're doing. So on doors that come towards us, outward doors, as soon as we start jamming, somebody's hitting it with a sledgehammer, let's say, and, or a flat-headed ax, as soon as we get to that inch and three-quarter mark, the tip of our fork or the tip of our ads, ads is right up against the, the door jam, which keeps the door from going even further into that room. So that's our door stop. And on a metal door jam, it's very easy to, to hammer that tip of that ads or the tip of the forks into that door jam. But it's very, very difficult to peel that away. So if you think about it, if you get in past an inch and, inch and three quarter and somebody's still hammering away you're driving into a metal door frame at this part so before you ever even force your door or pull that door out you have to defeat the door jam before you even get to the door to defeat it and so we've all seen it before where we've had a door jam that just looks like a you ripped open a pepsi can type of thing that is that is wrong that is that is not good so when you see somebody start tugging a couple times on that door and having to really put a lot of body weight into to pulling that thing you, we've messed that breach up. That is that is not correct. So that's why we mark them. So if somebody is hammering behind you, as soon as you see that line coming up towards your door frame, that's where you tell them to stop and you start pulling back out as far as you can. And so as they keep hitting, you now are avoiding that door jam. And we, we'll have some pictures of that that you can take a look at here later in, in this presentation. So the point is, is whether you're using your ads or you're using your forks, bringing geometry into it now, you are always going to use the ads or the forks, depending on what you're breaching on, as the hypotenuse to the right angle that is always going to be the door jam or the door stop. So you already have your L in there, if you will, that right angle. Now your job is to make your ads or your 
forks, depending on which way you're going, that will become the hypotenuse that you, you avoid the door jam and you get it between the door jam and the door. At that point, what do you now have? You now have an inclined plane, right? You have a you have a wedge that's going in there. So you're actually creating a mechanical advantage by driving that through and you're wedging it before you ever apply your second mechanical advantage, which will be your lever. So if we're looking at a 30 inch bar, which is what's on the screen right now, we know that if I'm going ads and you look at the measurement, look at that that width at an inch and three quarters on that ads compared to the width at an inch and three quarter on your forks. And if you measure it on this specific Halligan, which is the which is the Paratech, you will find that the one on the ads is is thinner. The width is thinner. It's about half the width as you will find on the forks. So with that, you have about half that MA. So you're looking at about a two to one on there when we met, take the measurements of how much you really need to go versus potentially almost a four to one. Uh, I think it works out to be like a three point eight nine to one when you're using the forks. So kind of that's neither here nor there, but also understand that taking the measurement of that thirty inch uh, halligan you're looking at about a 9.8 to 1 mechanical advantage as a lever when you've placed it properly in there so for our purposes we're gonna just call it a 10 to 1 and call it a day yet remember we are getting a mechanical advantage using it appropriately using it as a wedge because we are avoiding the door jam getting it between there it's, it has to come up so we're going to talk and give a word on the halligan that's on the left one on the right is one we typically use um, the one on the left I've used before, I've used it operationally. It was very, very popular for a while, and we still see them all over the place, uh, very heavily in law enforcement, obviously. So many of the people that are watching this are like, hey, man, that's that's the one I use. To steal from the Lego movie, that idea is, is just the worst, man. It looks good in concept, right? Oh, great, man, it's a 24-inch Halligan. It goes into my backpack. It's pretty cool. If you just compare the look of it to the one on the right, which is actually made to breach doors, you'll see, first of all, the wedge that's on there, the ads in, and you're going to see that it is a straight, straight wedge. Uh, that is not what we want to do for when we're trying to wrap it around the door to be able to get that purchase point to be able to pull it open. The other side of it is it's a lot wider. And some people will say, hey, if it's wider, then I'm getting a better mechanical advantage as my buddy is slamming it with a sledgehammer going in there, I'm getting more spread between the door and the door jam before I have to apply it as a lever. Yeah, you'll you'll get a little bit more, but what you're really gonna get is a lot more effort by your guy under sledge, which is gonna take more time because the amount of kinetic energy to drive a wider wedge into that, you will take up an energy expelled trying to do that. So if we look at physics, we know that the more gradual the wedge is, the better the mechanical advantage. If you think about what an inclined plane is from a physics standpoint just think about a ramp going up and let's say you're you're having to take a dolly up a ramp or wheeling something up a ramp the slower that incline is the more efficient it is for you to use versus you trying to go straight up a steep steep ramp it's going to take a lot more effort for you so getting that into that area that seam is going to the seam of that door is going to take a lot more kinetic energy a lot more effort for you to do that and then we see the same thing on the forks uh there's no bend to them like what we see on the right uh, it's just a not a good design at all i think the best part of it and best meaning sarcastic would be the pike that we kind of see over here i don't know people that that we work with have heard me say this a million times and and i'll probably uh censor it just a little bit for for this presentation but i, I don't know what anyone was thinking when that little nub was used right we can use a pike very efficiently for for certain things with hasps, uh, with padlocks and things like that, uh, one man, you know, baseball swings that we can do to do one man breaching. I am not sure what anyone was thinking, any designer was thinking when they put the nub on there that we see on the left. We don't know what you can use it for. It's not good for really anything. And I know that they put more of a pointed one on recently, but it's still very snub. It, it I don't, I don't know what they were thinking on their newest one or this one do you know on the one that you see there if you do run into trouble it's not really good for anything that has to do with breaching but you will fail to breach a door using anything with that pike if you're trying to do a one person baseball swing or anything like that or you're trying to breach a padlock so what you can do is after multiple failure fail attempts you potentially could put those forks 
into your into your crotch, which will put that nub right by your mouth. So you could potentially suckle that and still have a free arm to call your mom and ask her what, what you need to do. It's just not a, a good design. And when you go side by side on a realistic breaching door or on real doors and you compare one to the other, you really can't compare them. Uh, they are two completely different things. I will say one word uh, on the Paratech side is this is, like I said before, the Paratech single piece forge, the SPF. That is what we use. There is another Paratech out there, another Paratech, and I don't know if they call it the Halligan, the Hooligan. I think it's gone back and forth over the years, but it is a three-piece design, and I believe we have some pictures of that maybe in, I don't know, part three. That is not what we use. On that design, you will see it's got a very similar wedge type thing as the Halligan on the left over here. It, it, we use the Paratech SPF. We don't use the the three-piece, uh, the three-pinned piece uh, Halligan whatsoever. So just clarifying that on the Paratech side. All right, we're going to show a quick example of a one-man breach. With this, this is usually utilizing the Firehouse Innovations door that we talked about. I think we have a blog on that. It is a phenomenal door. It works really, really good. It was invented by a guy named Mike Perone, who's a great guy and a great, probably a better breacher. We hopefully will probably be doing a, a podcast with him pretty soon because that guy is unbelievable. It came from Ladder 175, FDNY, just a, a phenomenal experience that, that he has. So we're using a traditional method for this video, which is us standing in front of the door. What we're going to be doing with that ads is crushing it, and we're going to be crushing that door, which creates a gap. And we're going to look at pictures on the next slide that shows what it looks like on a real door. On the firehouse innovations or there's a high tension spring that's in the and if we're looking at this picture it's in the lower right hand corner which as i pull down it shifts that door backwards and it allows me to place a door chuck or a wedge in there to kind of hold it because once i would let go the door would kind of flop back in on a real metal door and we'll talk about the construction of that on the next slide it actually deforms it it crushes it so the amount of tension that it takes me to lever this door back with that spring is almost identical to the amount of force that you're going to have to put on a real door to actually deform it and crush it to be able to create that gap that's in there to be able to wedge it and hold your it kind of acts as a progressive capture as if we were doing rope rescue so in this purpose we are standing in front of the door and that's the technique that you'll see mike perone use in his videos that you'll see online of there we typically when we train if we're doing it for a tactical team military or or civilian or federal we can actually do the technique that you see on the video right now from i'm if you look at it i'm on the right hand side of the scene we can actually switch it over and i can be on the left hand of the swing so i can actually be out of the fatal funnel so if you are concerned that shots potentially could be coming through that door obviously you're not going to want to stand in front of that and do it so just understand that you can be outside of the fatal funnel doing this entire breach. So the part that I'm doing there, as far as crushing the door, we can stand on the other side. Uh, for our purposes, we were, we were kind of doing some videotaping with GoPros and didn't have a screen. So we made sure that we got everything in. That's what we're doing. We're standing in front of the door on this one. So remember, you can go to the outside. Also keep in mind, you know, why we like the Halligan, because we can also open doors that are inward doors that go into that classroom or into that house. We obviously can open outward doors and we can break padlocks very easily for us. Most inside school doors and residentials are inward swinging. So inside those schools, when you're doing those active shooters, those are going to be, a lot of those are going to be inward doors. The exterior doors of those schools are going to be the doors that we're kind of seeing right here, which are going to be those doors that come out towards you. In the next picture, those were all done at a school that was being destroyed so we were able to do it so you'll see those doors and and how that goes these can be open just as quick if not faster on inward doors with a halligan than you can a ram so if i take a halligan with me and let's say I even do a 24 inch pro bar so a little bit smaller but a, a good good halligan that would be the only thing that i'd need to take with me on that interior section within a school and i can breach doors that come towards me breach doors that go away from me and still use them for padlock breaches, uh, whether it's attached to a chain, whether it's on a, on a slide or it's on a hasp and staple. I can eliminate taking in a sledgehammer or flathead axe and bolt cutters and potentially a ram and on top of that halligan where I can just do those things with the halligans and just stay lighter, quicker. So what are the chances of you having to breach at a school that's in a lockdown? I would definitely tell you it's about 100%. As we said earlier in previous uh, video casts, that there is a high, high percentage, over 80% of the elementary schools as surveyed in 2013, their exterior doors lock automatically during school hours. 
So you, you potentially will have that breach right off the bat. The other side of it is we know that in school lockdown at that national level is recommended that maintenance people will go around and lock those exterior doors depending on what they feel their level of safety is. And that, as we said, is is kind of just a mix up. There's usually two types of lockdowns called, one that's in, involving something going on inside the school versus one going outside the school where potentially there's some violent action or uh, drive by or something like that within a couple blocks of that school. That school goes in lockdown because that threat is still outside. That's why a lot of those doors are, are called to be locked by the maintenance people. Yet there's still schools out there that only have one lockdown. When that lockdown gets called, you go into action. And that's that. That's what happens. So there's a really good chance that you're going to be having to breach just to get into that school. And once we get in there, when are teachers allowed to open the school doors for you? So you may need to get in that room because there's injured kids. You may need to get in that room to create a casualty collection point. You may need to get into that room for an eva- uh, a nonlinear or asymmetric evacuation. A bunch of reasons that you're going to need to get in that classroom door, yet they will be locked because that school will be on lockdown. So those interior doors are going to be locked. And when are they allowed to open it? They're not. Back in the day, it was one of those things where, hey, we slide our badge underneath. Uh, teacher sees the badge. Teacher unlocks the door. We're good to go. And then they realize that, hey, that's probably not a good idea. Uh, Anybody can pretty much get themselves a badge, slide it under the door, and then bad things will occur after that. So you're not. You're not getting in there. You're going to have to breach. So we just need to... We need to think about that. We need to think, make sure that we have the right tools. Uh, once you go into lockdown, those doors are not the easiest to potentially kick in if that's how we think we're going to do it. So have a plan. Know that you're going to have to breach and do it effectively and efficiently. So let's take a look at this video. So we wedged it, we gapped it. There's daylight between the two. Use the fork in because it's a better MA. And then we kind of finish it off. On the outside, we push down, we gap, we crush that door. We hold what we got. So pretty quiet so far. Now we're using the forks. We have daylight between the in the seam. Grab the very end of that halogen because that's where your MA is. That technique right there opens up the majority of the doors. That last part where we switch back from the forks over to the ads, normally you never even get to that point when you're doing breaching real door. So when we look at it, even on a, a door that has a high security lock on it, that high security means that it goes in, you know, between an inch and an inch and an inch and a half, and usually an inch, inch and a quarter, that that deadbolt goes into the frame that far. If you look at this door, we're dealing with a two by two pressure treated two by two right there, which I can tell you it's much more difficult than breaching your normal deadbolt that goes into the frame approximately an inch, maybe an inch and a quarter. Most times we don't have to go to that last part. The other side of it is if you are using a training door and you're in the open, it's not up against a wall. If I kept going backwards when I was forcing it with the halligan, I would actually be against the wall of that building. So don't get into bad habits where you keep going beyond that door. Next thing you know, you forced it, but your body is actually on the inside already. So uh, switch that over, hit your ads. You got your fulcrum, which is heavy, which is solid, which is part of the door frame on there. All right, so this is kind of what crushing looks like. So that's your normal door, your normal metal door that you see out there isn't metal all the way through, right? It's just a, it's just sheets of it that kind of surround that door with without getting into the construction of doors too much. And there's usually just kind of a corrugated material or cardboard on the inside of it. So it's just the the sheets on the outside that that are actually metal and they're they're pretty easy to deform, especially when you got a strong fulcrum in the form of a a metal door frame. So when we go in there, just pushing down just deforms that door. Now, if you look at the picture on the left, if I, I'm kind of pulling down, if we raised up a little bit, yeah, we're going to still have some deformation. But as we push down, we're not only deforming the door, we're taking out any of the empty space of that, that's already in that door when it's hung. So we can look at any door and we can kind of see different little gaps around there. We're killing all that. We're taking all that out. So if I would let go right there without putting a wedge in, I may lose the daylight that I have that I create between there. So the way that these sheets are laid, you'll see on the upper left one, when I push down, I'm getting all that deformation of that door, except for that last little thin piece of metal that's back against the door jam. So in the picture to the right, you'll see where I go in with the forks and just bend that right out. And now I'm through the door. And as soon as you move that, 
it's game over. And there's a couple different ways you can do that. One, you can slam your ads in there and it just bends it away from there. And you can throw your forks in or you can, in a lot of cases, you can just take your forks in there and just pull out, push outwards and slide it right in there. And so once that fork goes through there, that's that's it. And it is very, very easy. So that's kind of the the one man breach. And I think that Mike Crone actually has a prop that you can slide in doors, you kind of cut them and you can just kind of practice it like what we see in these pictures also. All right, so we're gonna take a look real quick at a padlock breach. So when we look at it, we know that at Virginia Tech, there was one, one door in particular that they could reach that padlock, could pull that out because of the slack that was in that chain. But how are we breaking that? If we look at it, if I had to tell you to train on certain padlocks, uh, Master makes a padlock that has a little sticker on it that says tough under fire. We see those everywhere. I don't know if they've got a contract within school systems or, or what they have, but very, very common padlock that you see out there. It is case hardened. Uh, it's double toe. So when we look at that, the, the padlocks sometimes are made to take the impact or kinetic impact of a, of a, of a bullet to shoot it. So that's not always going to work. A lot of people will also kind of do a padlock slap and try and break those toes out. But if we look at the general anatomy of a padlock, and we'll, we'll take a better look at it here pretty soon, that shackle can't take the force that you can put onto it with with a halligan. So when we when we look at that, we can also apply that same technique to a link that's in the chain, but it's extremely, extremely easy, easy technique that makes life easy. And if we look at the principles of it, it allows us to improvise using a very similar technique. So where I will have the forks over that padlock and start twisting it, and you wanna make sure that it stays real even. You wanna make sure that as the padlock comes out, and you'll see this in the video, that it stays basically, the body of that padlock stays parallel with the ground. Once it starts canting in a direction or two, you're gonna bring some of the chain into it. And we just wanna isolate it onto the shackle. We don't wanna make it harder than what it has to be. So if it starts going off center a little bit, just kinda of refocus it back in and break that padlock really, really quick. We've been able to do a bunch of different improvs, whether it's with a tire iron, whether it's with large, a larger kind of industrial screwdriver, uh, realizing that if we grabbed a piece of PVC behind there, we could use that kind of as a cheater bar with it. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can you can execute this, but let's take a look at the technique real quick. So we got the body that's kind of staying just parallel with it. It's not going off center. And as it goes, we've isolated the shackle and then you just push up. I would tell you to go give it a whirl you will be amazed at how easy it is. Once you start getting into some of your exotic metals, like boron, uh, you're still going to be able to do this. The master borons we've had better success with than the Brinks borons, but you're going to be able to knock it out. If it is a extremely thick, rated at 10 out of 10, boron lock that so, sort of has an octagonal shape to, uh, to the shackle and that is heavy, heavy, realize that as I put those forks on, as you saw in the video, I can place another halligan from the other side with opposing forks and then we just kind of do what's called we just call a windmill where as we're pulling it i kind of hand it off to you you grab mine i grab your we just keep twisting it and that provides plenty of force to to break even the heavier duty borons just by adding a second second halligan into that so with that technique there's usually always three parts to a padlock system whether it's a chain a hasman staple or a throw and with that, one of those pieces is going to end up being your weak link. We don't have boron Haspen staples with onto, you know, boron doors with boron screws and this and that. So as we go, and we'll, we'll probably see this in, a, in another breaching in the Halligan portion, we'll show you one where we actually had a heavy duty chain with a heavy duty boron. And as we twisted it on a push bar system like you'd find in a school, we actually broke the entire push bar off, which allowed us to make entry because the chain and the padlock sent up. So every padlock is part of a system. It's three parts. So you've got the padlock, and in this case, you have the chain, and then you have what the chain is attached to. So we wanted to make sure that it was the padlock we broke on this one, so we put it right into some eye bolts. You'll see what happens when when we use heavy-duty padlock, heavy-duty chain, and what that looks like on a push. So even if it's a Haspen staple, Right, we have the padlock, we have the Haspen staple, and then we have whatever the Haspen staple is attached to, which is usually within the seam of a door. So we have a three-part series. Something in there is going to break, and we've actually had 
a lot of successful improvs with tire irons that work really good doing the same technique where you put the tire iron just enough that you got the purchase point inside the middle of the shackle and start twisting it clockwise or counterclockwise and and snapping that thing too not everybody's going to have a halligan or the capability of improving. So when we look at those events where we have potential fortification, this was this was taken kind of in the in the Midwest. So we want to thank John for for this video. It was a school that these guys were doing some training on. So when we look into it, they're going to drive this vehicle into the school door that's that's locked. And in it, a lot of people are like, not everybody, not every shooter, like what happened in Virginia Tech with Cho, is going to shoot themselves when you make entry, right? Because we've already, we've already talked about that quite a bit in the last podcast, in the last video cast. But what you're doing is you're creating a perturbation. And they're inside, they're fortified, and they're doing what they want. They're going through shooting at will. They've got all the time in the world. You're, you're locked outside, and they can continue doing that until you make entry. Once you make entry no matter what you you become inside their their OODA loop if you will and by causing a perturbation now they've got to do something they've got to react to you now which is what we want so even if they don't shoot themselves they may make a run for it they may barricade themselves or with a hostage they may decide hey this is it i'm going out suicide by cop and i'm just going to charge you and get in a gunfight and get smoked whatever it is one, you've regained the initiative, and two, you've gotten into their OODA loop to where whatever they were doing, which is probably murdering innocent people, you have stopped that and caused them to have to make a decision on what they're now going to do. So great video. Once again, thanks to John for this one. There you go. Fairly effective. So you're in and then you can go to business. So with that, what will the next evolution be? I would tell you this. I've got some ideas, but we're definitely not going to broadcast them on, on this media platform. But I would tell you to think sociopathic because it's not good enough that we can get into the last event because we saw within that six month period how it evolved so quickly even within five days, how it got exponentially better than, than what was done at Platte Canyon uh, as far as nickel mines, more effective. And then six months later, we saw how Cho evolved that. So add complexity, add difficulty into your training. For some reason, we always feel like we need to end training on a good note, right? Hey, let's, let's knock this out. And hey, if they come in and do this right and do this right, then, you know, let them kill you. Let them, let them shoot you. Let them, you know, fire this ammunition at you or whatever. Let's end these operators or these patrol officers or whoever on a good note. And I would call BS on that all day. The biggest lessons I've ever learned was from my failures, from my inability to execute what I needed to do. And it caused me to think about other ways, different ways, better ways to improve in those capabilities. And we're not canines, right? We end canines on some good notes, right? They always find the the substance, the bomb, the, the drugs, whatever. And we ended on a good note. We are not canines. We don't need that with our people. We need to have our people always trying to improve where they are. They're never good enough because we do not know and we cannot dictate what that next threat is going to bring towards us. So know the next one will probably evolve and we need to be prepared for that.